Hi there. I'm Christine Zips, investigative health journalist, and I'm thrilled tonight to have you all here. We're very happy to welcome Dr. Timothy Sheckley to be our guest interviewee this evening. And um, Tim is a senior research fellow of the National Institute for Science, Law, and Public Policy. And he's author of many publications, including the report, Reinventing Wires, Future of Landlines and Networks. And we'll be covering that this evening. And you'll see his complete bio in the comments section below. So this will be edited lightly and posted on YouTube so everyone can um, have a chance to listen to this again or for the first time if you're not able to join us this evening. So um, with that, if um, Tim, if you're ready to get going, we will let yeah. the questions come to you. Well, thank you, Christine, yes. All right, very good. So we'd, um, I hope this isn't too much of a curveball, but I thought it might be interesting for everyone if you would like to share how a visit to Sonoma County, California, and to sample wine and enjoy the coastline led you to produce this report. Oh, yes, that's in a little prologue in the front. It, it was kind of the inspiration. It was a four-year effort writing this paper, but really I'd been thinking about it for years. That was in, I guess, 2000, which was quite a while back. I just happened to uh, to see the <clears throat> stumble across a, in a kind of a wilderness setting, an installation of uh, optical fiber on a little back road. I didn't know what it was and where it was going, but it was... Uh, it, I found out that it was actually part of a major link to the to Asia that was going through Sonoma County to Point Arena, uh, <clears throat> and uh, kind of impressed me that it was so nondescript and, and uh, almost invisible, yet it was a major traffic route to the Far East. And I just had to, uh, I was just impressed with the capacity of that medium, optical fiber. That's that's interesting how you connected what was happening there with this the, with this bigger picture. So we, we're glad it did. <laughs> it's amazing how inspiration can come in the strangest ways, right? <laughs> yeah, <it was laughs> coincidence. Very good. All right. Well, let's see. You you've stated that broadband networks and the internet must be steered toward the fastest, most reliable, future-proof, and secure infrastructure available. But then you say that such infrastructure may be, must be wired, not wireless. And it seems like you're almost suggesting our tech future would do well to revisit our past. Would you care to elaborate on that? Well, I think that um, we have to keep in mind that even the wireless systems that we have become so commonplace in our little mobile phones and, and smartphones and the other devices that we depend on, are not <clears throat> really based on on wireless. The only part that's wireless is the last mile or the last few hundred feet, because it, we have this illusion that there's this cloud, this wireless cloud up in the sky, and these signals are all going to this cloud. We use that metaphor, which is very misleading, because there is no such thing. It's all wires, and uh, they, they could never achieve the performance they need without using uh, uh, fiber wires or copper wires and uh, <clears throat> part of the the, the uh, you have to keep in mind that wireless is really an inferior medium and it's really for thing for mobility it's except for mobility it's inferior in every other respect to uh, hard wiring of uh, networks and um, uh, it wireless is for things that move and uh, Due to the, uh, uh, w my report po points out exactly the history of why the things came to be the way they are. The fact that, that the, the political and economic issues uh, or, or actions in the Telecom Act of 1996 in particular distorted the, the market to the point where they um, we gave an, a, an, a, an unusual advantage to wireless. It was a deregulated while everything else was regulated, essentially. And it, uh, it cr created a, um, a, an incentive to, to, develop, to overdevelop wireless networks. 
Excellent. I'd be, you're, you're touching upon another question, so but, but that's great. And um, was just just wondering if you might chat about um, how how much of the so-called demand for faster data download speeds is driven by a tech addicted society. Well, it's mostly about <clears throat> it, it's a tech addicted, but it's actually I'd say more mostly ad addicted media industry addicted to advertising and it's this advertising model that's per, that since uh, the internet was was uh, became a public um public internet in probably ni 1995 to 90 to 2000 in that time frame it made a transition to, uh, to a commercial medium driven entirely by advertising and that has created enormous distortions i think in the original to the original concept behind the internet. And uh, the advertise it's the, the media industry that's addicted to the advertising and that's driven a lot of the technology and uh, we see that in the, in the press a lot lately in, in regard to particularly to the lack of privacy and security of the internet. Right, it, it's amazing how much our, um, our mainstream media is just involved in so many of, of these things that it's not widely known, it doesn't seem. So that, that's interesting to look at it that way. So I was wondering, you know, how is it that investment in wired, not wireless information infrastructure is needed across the U.S. right now? Well, I point out in my report that the U.S. is way down the line, probably number 17, 16 or 17, depending on how you measure it in the developed world in terms of access and the quality of access, access speed and quality to the internet for its population. The, uh, we're really behind and the reason is the uh, monopoly structure that has, has been propelled by the wireless industry in particular uh, and, and the wired industry because the, the carriers that have built the wireless have also the ones that dominate the wires. Uh, that uh, in the, uh, I point out in the report is primarily Comcast uh, and uh, and Verizon in the wireless space. Excellent. So, um, and, and again, if it seems like I'm going a little bit off topic, I, I, I've, I've looked for these questions based on your report. So I'm hoping that this will produce a, a broad brush of understanding from all that you've shared. If we were to cover all aspects this evening, we'd be here for a few weeks, I think. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate that. And moving on to the next one is, you know, how would you suggest, so many people will say, well, we need to contact our local legislators, whether they're local or state, federal, um, to convince them to, to, to at least maybe do a, um, a precautionary principle stance on this rolling forward of this technology with the, the 5G, the wireless versus wired. So, you know, with that in mind, how would you suggest that legislators be persuaded to stand for wired technology over wireless, given the tremendous lobbying budget and efforts they have within the industry? Well, um, yeah, the five G the five G issue is one that's just come particularly forward in, recently in the last few months because of the push by the the industry, but the and all the hype around it. And uh, but but really, uh, the primary th thrust of of my paper is that the, the the access to the internet is like a public utility. It's like I compare it to to um, uh, to to water service or s sewer service or s paved streets, it's a fundamental public utility, and that means optical fiber to every house and business in the in the country. And then, if you want wireless on top of that, if you're going to be moving around, fine, you can put that on top of it. But it's not a substitute for wires. And I and the five G issue is is mainly about trying to get you to think or get the public to think that the only way to get internet access or the, or the best way to get it is over wireless uh, using 5G. Well, that's, uh, that's uh, really not, doesn't make any sense. 
And the way to, to fix this situation, you ask, you know, it's simply political action at the local level. That's the only way to do it. And since we have such a failure of nas- at the national policy level, the you know, all politics is really local to start with. So you need to, uh, my paper advocates uh, that every city and community and town in the country get the, <clears throat> develop their own fiber infrastructure, just like they might their own water system. That's the best way to go. And then, and then the uh, carriers can do, or whoever wants to can develop uh, their wireless networks, but that shouldn't be their only choice. That, that that's good to better understand that it sounds like they they are uh, working on if they don't already have a monopoly in place so you know i and, and i was wondering you touched upon earlier um about the telecom act of 1996 but i'm wondering what effect um that w- are we seeing from that within the industry well the the, the real effect was that the the with the deregulation of the phone in, uh, industry, the, the bell system was broken up in, 19, in the 1980s. And I go into some of the detail about that, the end of the 1980s. And that <clears throat> broke the, the bell system into seven regional bell companies. And then those bell companies um, were operating the local wires, but they at the same time were introducing this new technology of wireless you know, phones. And uh, so what happened was, that since the wireless was deregulated, all of the phone companies spun off their, uh, they used the public assets to spin off private assets and create new mobile phone uh, subsidiaries. And then the management of those um, uh, regional bell companies then tr- t- went to the uh, wireless ones and abandoned, essentially abandoned the wires and uh, <clears throat> or left them to... Uh, you know, to not be developed, to just languish and uh, put all their money, the pu- the public's money, into into developing wireless networks and make made themselves a ton of money. So uh, that happened, uh, you know, over a period of time, and um, and then recently, what we've seen happen just to, since to around two thousand five, they started. Uh, you know, to fe- to prevent the public uh, and municipalities from developing, from picking up the slack and and modernizing their fiber networks, their low, their wire, their wires, their wired phone system, uh, with fo- with optical fiber to pre- prevent that. Tw- Twenty, they got bills passed quietly in 20 states. An organization called ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, uh, quietly. Uh, managed to get 20 or 21 states to adopt laws that prevented municipalities from competing with uh, with the uh, conventional carriers and uh, mainly wireless carriers, but all, all of them. And uh, and then uh, that was around 2005, 2006. And then more this past year in 2017, they went even further and they uh, got uh, laws passed in uh, about 20 states to prevent uh, localities from e- regulating cell tower siting and so that they could because they realized that they wanted to move to a new generation of wireless uh, because they'd maxed out the sales of the older generation and they they would the new generation would require many many more cell sites uh, saturating the environment with electromagnetic fields and so they would uh, they <clears throat> in order to do that they had to preempt local regulation of those uh, cell sites because it would be too costly if they had to pay their own way. So um, they got they, they got laws passed in 20 states to do that. So uh, now we're saddled with that. And I think what the people have to do is go out and repeal those laws and, and, and backtrack and get their own fiber. Amazing. And I know you've done so much work with them um, with moving that forward in several states like Tennessee and, and Colorado, and, and we'll touch on that in a little bit. But it, it almost seems to me um, that the FCC is uh, feels fairly uh, free and loose with the rules, and they kind of make them up as they go along to suit their purposes. But it's kind of hard to, to to stand up against that when, you know, we, we feel like we're compelled to follow the rules and maybe not so much with them. But again, I'm just kind of throwing that out for what that might be worth. But 
um, you know, with, with other countries investing in a wiser path to a fast and reliable information system, why do you think the U.S. is lagging behind him on that? Well, because the, 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 in, in the U.S., in, in other countries, a lot of the uh, phone systems were owned by their governments already. But mm. in this, <clears throat> and they could make those changes. They could make whatever changes they wanted to. And they, um, you know, some countries uh, were able to do that, uh, to put in a, a lot of fiber. Uh, in this country, um, essentially dominated by uh, th I did, what I didn't finish saying before was that these regional bell companies then reconsolidated into a monopoly. It's what I call a triopoly. Uh, the AT&T and Verizon basically bought up all of the regional bell companies and reconstituted the bell system uh, monopoly uh, and an even larger uh, and, uh, uh, and more, uh, more dominant than even the bell system. And, uh, sort of the bell system without the, the the tradition of responsibility that the bell system had. So they, um, they, they've prevented the, the rollout of, uh, or the, they've maintained an, uh, an atmosphere, they've, they've maintained a situation of artificial scarcity and high prices and poor service. And they have made a lot of money doing that. And so they're happy with it. Amazing. Yeah, really appreciate your explanation with this. It makes things a, a lot more clear. So, you know, I, you know, how would how would you see the tech landscape changing if this generation allows five G to fully deploy? Well, that's uh, that's kind of kind of scary. The um, the five G is really a, an unnecessary transition it's only necessary to get you to buy a new phone because the phone the sales of, of the phones have maxed out and they have widely hyped the 5g that it is a a, a form that will be high they could say about they talk about the high super high speed and the low latency well, what is that good for well it's really mainly good for delivering more ads and video games that's about it because uh, they talk about how it could be, uh, how it will revolutionize uh, uh, industry. Well, industry likes wires. They like reliability. Industry is not, uh, I don't think, uh, moving toward wireless um, uh, in, in, in industrial applications. The, um, that we've, I work on technical standards for uh, wires and wire, and a lot of the content of my paper, one whole chapter is about the latest in what's done with copper wire, uh, which could almost meet the performance in some circumstances of fiber, and also fiber. The two of those uh, are the, certainly a dominant um, in, uh, in industrial use. The, um, <clears throat> the vision of uh, 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 the whole city being wire, you know, essentially supplied by 5G is, is really kind of, um, it's going to be colossally expensive uh, the public is going to have to bear the cost because the way that they've uh, uh, preempted local regulation and control and uh, it's just a money machine and it's mainly based for advertising and I don't think that is a big benefit to the public and the public needs to take control of it and get back to the wires and get 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 fiber to the home and to the office <laughs> Amazing. And, and kind of touching upon that, I think I've shared, shared this with you before that um, I recently heard the former chair of the FCC, Tom Wheeler, was on a program and he almost seemed to be bragging. And he said, let me just share with you the state of the economy of, of the telecom industry. And what's going to be really cool, essentially, he said, is that, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be selling or harvesting this usage data. Um, and then the company is going to be hoarding it and then selling it off to third party investors. And, you know, it, it's almost like, did he, you know, did he really mean to say that out loud? I mean, what do you, what do you think of that? I know harvest data and data harvesting is, is huge, even in the schools. So, um, you know, and, and there's no secret that that's been happening back with smart meters and, 
you know, that that's one of the goals that they're doing as well. And selling new phones sounds certainly like it's part of it. But well, this is a this is a very good point. This, I'm glad you mentioned that because, uh, you know, in in a way, Wheeler is, is showing us the the truth here because it's all about the data. It's about about invading your privacy, taking your data, and selling it, and using it at, not just selling it, but using it in in an incredibly complex way to uh, to, to to make more money. There's a couple of interesting books on this. I mean. The uh, one that I, I just read that I, I really enjoyed was a book, a new book called Anti-Social Media by Siva, I can't pronounce his last name, it's an Indian name, it starts with a V, but he, he, it's, a, it's, it's really about Facebook and how, how the, the incredible social effects of a company like Facebook, whose whole economy and the economy of Google, the biggest corp, couple of the biggest corporations in the world now, um, uh, is entirely based on data, on your data, and figuring out how to turn that into money. And to drive uh, all the technology, um, I point out repeatedly in my paper that the, the, the theme, the recurring theme is that the IT business model that has developed in media technology can be described as three, three bullet points. One, sell more chips by embedding them into everything you can think of sell more app, software apps, uh, preferably in a manner that locks a consumer into a cloud-based subscription revenue model mm -hmm. and planned obsolescence. And thirdly, collect more consumer personal data to monetize primarily through advertising. So that's, the, that's, the, the, that's what the internet unfortunately has morphed into and the, to a large part, that's what, what 5G and all the wireless technologies are all about. It's about those three things, selling more chips, collecting more data, and, uh, and, and forced obsolescence. And that's the difference between fiber and, uh, and wireless uh, smartphones is that wireless, fiber isn't, doesn't get obsolete. Phones will get obsolete every couple of years. And they get you to buy new ones. And that's what it's all about. It's amazing. I, I just... Mm. <laughs> well, we're plodding along, and thank you for mentioning that book. I've, I've uh, made note of that here in the notes a little bit. And um, I, I recently read, um, I thought it was a fascinating article by Jeremy Nadler. I believe he's from the UK, called 5, 5G, The Final Assault. And he says, while 5G is being sold to the public as an enhancement of the quality of video streaming for media and entertainment, what is really driving it is the creation of the conditions within which electronic or artificial intelligence will be able to assume an ever greater presence in our lives. Wondering if you agree with this theory. This is a little extra one I threw in there, Tim. <laughs> yeah, well, that it makes sense to me. I think yep. that's that's in fact this artificial intelligence, uh, what, whatever you know, whatever that turns out to be, and of course, a lot of it is is completely unknown at this point. But uh, it's really about, uh, unfortunately, artificial intelligence is how to make more money off of your data. That that's what it boils down to, and it and it could result in some pretty strange social transformations that we don't, I don't think we're, I, could, I don't know what to think of it. It's like, like uh, go back and read Frankenstein. <laughs> the, um, yep. uh, I should point out there is another book that, uh, that, that is, uh, I can, uh, that I've heard of lately. I have not read the book, but I know the author. The, uh, uh, the book is called Fiber. And it's just been, uh, I think, in the last couple of weeks, it was uh, published, and it was it's by Susan Crawford, who's a, a law professor at, uh, Har I think, Harvard and Law School, and she has written extensively on the, these topics. I have uh, quoted from her extensively in my report, uh, of an earlier book that she wrote, which was called A Captive Audience, and uh, and now she's got a new book that's basically the uh, making you know making the case uh, the same case I'm making basically that fiber is is a public necessity. Excellent. I, I like the way that you're building that, and um, just 
asking a question that I believe we know the answer to. We can stream right along, but for purposes of folks who might be coming new to this, would you say that the FCC has the public's best interest at heart? Well, that's, a, a, that's another good point. The, the FCC, I, I quote in my report from a, another Harvard document uh, uh, from the, uh, uh, it's a report called the Captive Agency. Um, the um, Captured Agency, I'm sorry. And that is uh, a, a, about the FCC in particular, but there, there's this phenomenon called regulatory capture, and that is the tendency of regulatory agencies to be captured by the, a, the industries that they regulate. And this is a chronic problem, particularly in America. It's not just America, and it's everywhere. But it's worse here, I think, than in most places. And the FCC is a good example. Like Wheeler was uh, uh, running the FCC during the the, uh, the Obama administration, and he he was the chair. And he's from the the the, the mobile phone industry. He and he's now <laughs> back in the in the same industry again. Uh, the uh, um, these guys come from the, the regulators come from the cable and the, and the wireless industry. And the, 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 when, when Trump has appointed a guy, that's even worse. The Verizon, the, the, one of the lead attorneys for Verizon, he's the chairman of the FCC. How in the world can you have right. a, a fair regulation regulatory system that uh, runs that way? That's ridiculous. Exactly. Like the, uh, the current chair, Ajit Pai, is uh, that attorney for Verizon. And uh, the book you mentioned, Capture, the, the paper you mentioned, Captured Agency by Norm Alster, is, is excellent and, and really does point out some wonderful points with that. So, um, you know, wondering, you know, if the wireless and, and millimeter wave technology, has it been proven safe? Another question we know the answer to, but might just bear mentioning really quickly. Oh, yes. The, um, that's a good point, too. The, um, it, it, the answer is no. Uh, it hasn't been proven safe. It hasn't been shown in any way uh, because the, the industry hasn't supported this kind of research. They don't want it. To, they don't want to cover the issue. The, there's, there, but there, nevertheless, there's accumulating evidence that, that there's, there's a biological and effects of electromagnetic fields and, and, and the health, potential health effects. There's a number of studies that show that, and it has been, the industry has just glossed over it and tried to sweep it all under the rug. They don't even want to consider it. The, um, it's not the primary thrust of my report, but it's certainly I've covered it in a, a number of ways because I am familiar with some of the research that's actually being done here at the University of Colorado on the biological effects of electromagnetic fields. And it's been demonstrated um, that you can control, uh, you know, things like tumor growth can be controlled by uh, manipulating uh, the frequency and uh, uh, time delays in, um, in uh, 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 radio signals um, and microwave signals. So um, <clears throat> that they just don't know all the implications of that. And, and there may be even some beneficial uh, effects that can be derived from it, but this, it's completely uh, been ignored and not funded by, by the industry because they don't want to know. Uh, so I think that's, there's a, the reason that, to apply the uh, precautionary principle here until, and not, you know, inundate our whole society with ele more electronic electromagnetic radiation like than we have already, which is I enormous now. No need to do that until we understand it better. I think it's it's not it's not a wise thing to do. And besides, there's a better alternative anyway. Uh, <clears throat> not then. That's not to mention the health. When you talk about health, there's another dimension to health too, and that is the psychological and learning. Uh, uh, issues around it, and uh, um, and uh, and the effects on the social effects of these media, the the um, the, the the whole F Facebook uh, book that I mentioned before goes into that. The political effects of of that kind of media. Right, right. I'm, I'm glad you touched upon that. We're going to be getting into that in just a little bit as well. Um, but, you know, just wondering, you know, for those of us who might be feeling like we're dealing with a little bit of David and Goliath syndrome, you know, what, 
can you think of it, you know, what type of resources might we have at our disposal to stand up against this push from industry and government? Well, what we have mainly is, is <clears throat> political action, at least in, 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 in this country, we can mobilize, we can use the media, um, and, and we can actually mo use it to mobilize people and but starting with your local city councils and your state legislatures um, to get these uh, to get this these laws changed that put unfair advantage in the hands of these uh, carriers get this thing straightened out so that people can get uh, re for instance repeal these laws that prohibit localities from regulating wireless and also from installing fiber for their uh, populations and get make that acceptable as a public utility. That's, that's the only place I know to start. You can, the, the federal level is, is a disaster at this point uh, and, and completely irresponsible. So we need to, we need to make our, our local city councils responsible and, uh, and our county commissioners and work at the local level. That's the only way I know to, to address this. Thank, thank you, Tim, on that. And, and it, it kind of seems like, would you, would you suggest that it might be a good move when we meet with our local representatives to um, allude to, uh, maybe subtly or maybe not so subtly, that, um, you know, they are really, they need to know that they're at potential risk of being held personally liable um, if they're, you know, if, if they choose to just kind of ignore this, if they don't try to help, help be part of the solution rather than continue the problem. Yeah, and there, that's that's definitely an approach, and it, but it takes money and effort to do that. And uh, but the, the first place is they could get kicked out of office. They could get uh, 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 <clears throat> just not not reelected, and someone else can get elected. That's the main thing you do. Um, that's but uh, there's there's legal routes. There's a lot of different avenues that you can pursue, but they take time and they take effort and organization and money. All right, well, you touched upon like the copper, the copper wire. Um, and I think we'd find it interesting if you'd, you know, share about how the large network, uh, networks of varied copper wire and state-of-the-art optical fiber can provide the bedrock of a health safe national communication system. Yeah, I think that the the one of the aspects that I mentioned is that that the that conventional copper wire actually has far more capacity than it used to, just because the the sophistication of the technology that's gone into uh, into that. Uh, we have um, it, it makes sense now to uh, to not tear out the the copper. One benefit of the old copper phone system was that it was was uh, resilient. It, po it was self-powered. The, uh, the phone system supplied its own DC power for the phones. That was back, goes back into the, the uh, you know, a century ago when they first started installing phones. They, they didn't have electricity, so they su the phone company supplied its own electricity for the phones. And uh, keep in mind, those, when we've had forest fires around here, uh, we had a number of them uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the phone, a lot of the phones still worked even when the power system went down. Um, now that's not even true with optical fiber, but there's ways around it. There's way to, ways to engineer systems that uh, can uh, ha be self-powered and also high speed. Uh, so it doesn't make sense to take out the wires. Another reason is that those wires represent a right of way. They represent an established path, communication path to every subscriber. And if and the, the a lot of the uh, the the phone the uh, the triopoly um, guys are tearing out that or decommissioning that copper and leaving a lot of people with no communication when, because the a lot of the areas are just not served by wireless and when there's a disaster the wireless goes down first and uh, it can get overloaded more quickly because it's not engineered the same way as an old uh, wired system. Uh, the old copper wired system and, uh, and the, even the fiber. And it's, um, it's, so it's not as resilient. And, uh, and the, the cell towers go down, they lose their power, and then they're dead. And, uh, uh, you know, when you've got forest fires, these huge storms, 
or floods. Um, it's just not as resilient a system. A buried fiber system has got to be the most resilient and most reliable system you could build. Thank, thank you for that. And, and, and it, it's also more vulnerable in, in other ways. Like I, I believe it's, uh, it, it exposes us to, uh, to being hacked by those who want to cut into the systems. And it just seems like it's taking away our control um, for this utility. But, you know, I, I was wondering that, you know, I understand that the fiber optic networks and the hybrid um, fiber optic networks realized impressive economic benefits of high-speed wired systems that pay for themselves. And for example, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, a $220 million investment has yielded $865 million, you state in your report, in economic growth for the city. And Longmont, Colorado, has seen similar results. And how would we get more of this and less of the wireless propaganda? Well, the, in fact, I, today, Longmont, I just read in the paper today, in the Boulder paper here, that, uh, that Longmont got an award, a national award for the most advanced, advanced uh, system in the world, just to, or in the country anyway, um, a national award of, for their system called Nextlight. That's the name of it. It's run by the Electric Power Company, which is also owned by the Longmont City, the city of Longmont. And... Uh, um, the neighboring city, Fort Collins, is going to be installing a very similar system. They also own their own electric power system. So if, if, a, if, a, if a municipality owns their own electric power system uh, already, it's, it's, a, or, uh, um, uh, it's a very easy thing for them to go forward and, uh, and much less expensive for them to go ahead and run fiber along with the power. Uh, if, they do, if it's not, uh, if they if the community doesn't own its own electricity, it's a little more expensive. They have they can still do it. It's just that it's a, it's a bigger deal. Um, so um, I don't know if I addressed your question. There. It, you you did, and um, I, I was just wondering that when when communities own their own systems, does that pretty much preclude them from being um, victim? for lack of a better word, from industry who are trying to run roughshod with their program? Can they just say, I mean, does industry leave them alone when they see they have their own system set up or? Well, the industry can, uh, can put in, they can still put in their, uh, they can offer mobile phone service or, or mobile, uh, <clears throat> you know, wireless services. It's just that those aren't, um, they, they don't necessarily do the same thing. Uh, the the city the, the the fiber is a basic utility and you're sitting in your home or your business you need that kind of access that you can get over that fiber the gigabit service uh, symmetrical service so you can run a server in your own house if you want to do business that way or you want to use advanced services it just doesn't work with a mobile device they, mm -hmm. the mobile devices are made for a different purpose and they're good at certain things but they're not good at the kinds of things you want to do in your house or your business, and uh, the but the 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 the, 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 comp the cities that have their own uh, system, uh, their own electric power system can run their fiber, but the that doesn't preclude wireless carriers from offering wireless services, and wireless services have a use, and they're they're you know, very uh, very uh, convenient for s moving around. And uh, it's just not your, it shouldn't be your only access, I guess. And that's the, the main point. So every community needs to figure out how to do this and do it in a manner where they control the, fi the, the fiber and they control the prices and the service and the neutrality of it. And uh, don't leave it to the carriers to do that because they won't get it if they do. So, sounds good. It's, it's good to have choices on that. And so how would you suggest, Tim, that we inspire our communities to realize that they must assume local responsibility for creating safe and economical high-speed internet access for all citizens? So how do we convince them? You how do we inspire them to? Inspire them. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I... I don't know. I guess it ha it has to do with. Um, um, I think a, a major part of it is uh, um, 
wanting to get to get, get regain control over your in, of your uh, environment and getting control over your communication and not be subject to what these uh, carriers decide to offer and not I know that um, there's a lot a growing concern about the effects of this media I, I was I recently had a occasion to talk to a, an individual who I was on an airplane and the guy sitting next to me was flying back from Alaska and he'd been installing uh, uh, wireless towers in Alaska uh, and um, he got to talking to me. He was using his mobile phone to talk to his wife on the, you know, to tell her about his, his travel schedule. But he, we got to talking and I asked him if he was involved in installing 5G and he said he just got, it was doing some of that and it was, uh, it was going to be a big deal of uh, business for him, but he was also, deeply concerned about the effects it was having on his children. And, uh, and he was talking about their, their, the way they used the, the smartphones. Uh, even though he was a, a user himself, he, he was worried about the effect it was having on his children and his family. I mean, I found this kind of astounding. It is a dilemma it's because uh, people are, are be, become essentially addicted to these things and they don't realize the effect it's having on them until it's too late. Definitely, definitely. I, that it, it, it's astounding, and it, it's it's kind of encouraging, kind of surprising at the same time. It's almost like so many people can compartmentalize in one direction, and it's all also like they're having a mirror held up to their own behavior. And you know, they might say, "Well, you know, I know it's important, but if if I acknowledge that I need to make a change, then I'm going to have to change my behavior." So it, it's a real dilemma, uh, absolutely for sure. And we're going to be touching into more on the aspects of how it how that uh, affects children in in just a little bit. But I'm wondering if you might address uh, what percentage of the 5G technology is intended for use for human consumption. As versus machine to mis machine usage or M2M usage, and if higher percentages for the M2M communications, who pays for that? Well, I know that a lot of the hype around 5G is talking about M2M and and uh, in, what they call Internet of Things, but <clears throat> I were I've been kind of in that industry for. 20 years. Uh, we didn't call it IoT, inter Internet of Things, but that's what it, what it is. Um, I think it, M2M is very speculative. It's blue sky. That the, in, the idea that, that we're going to... 5G doesn't really empower uh, M2M or, or IoT. And there's a couple of reasons. The, the 5G, uh, the, those devices, um, that type of thing usually doesn't uh, for most applications, sensor networks and things like that, they don't need that kind of speed. They don't need that the, the kinds of things that are being touted around the speed and latency that's being touted around 5G because they, they just need reliable communication on a periodic basis that, um, that doesn't require that kind of performance. There's a lot of hype about... Uh, 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 autonomous vehicles and that they're going to depend on 5G. Well, I think that's, that's a fiction. That is, doesn't make any sense to me at all because um, vehicles are moving, but the, the 5G is such as the, if they go with the millimeter wave frequencies, which, uh, which they are talking about, they have to have too many, uh, too much uh, infrastructure. Uh, they have to got to have these poles every 80 feet or 100 feet to make that kind of a system work. And it's just not going to work that way. Um, and besides, I think there's a, a good question as to whether we will, will have autonomous vehicles in any uh, reasonable time frame. I think there's a serious doubt that there's any use for it. It's again, the more the technology looking for a solution. It's the semiconductor industry looking to sell more chips and pack your car with more and more electronics. That's what it's about. And they've, they've, they've really, um, uh, they've uh, intimidated the automobile industry to the point where the automobile industry feels they've got to pack the cars with electronics uh, or the, uh, the Silicon Valley guys will do it for them. And so they, 
they're all on the same bandwagon, but they haven't really thought it through. Do people really need that? And what does it really do? Um, uh, and it's, I don't think it will depend on 5G. There's a, certainly a use for for wireless communication, but it's not um, it, it's not what's being touted as 5G. Excellent. And we've definitely seen more and more of those advertisements for new automobiles coming online with all the technology, the Bluetooth. Even I think it was Audi, I believe, was talking about a. Um, virtual reality headset for the back seat to make more of an experience for those movies the kids are watching. And yeah. um, on, on so many levels, uh, that's just, uh, I'm sure you'll agree that's not a good idea. But yeah, the, the latest Wall Street Journal has a whole article on the war, the war over your dashboard. Now they want to put ads and everything they can think of on the dashboard of the car. No. That's the latest space they can get their hands on for advertising. Oh, oh so, my. I mean, as if, as if people texting while driving isn't distracting <laughs> enough. Right. It's no. ridiculous. It's, oh. uh, it's, 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 absurd. it's written, reached the point of absurdity. It's stranger uh, than fiction, you know? It, it really it, is. I say this as a designer, uh, you know, I've been involved in this industry for at the, d the design level for many, many years. And it's just, it's just a, a turned into a, a hype fest. It, it, so it absolutely, it absolutely it, has. Yeah, I've heard an article like 5G, you know, is it hype or is it a myth or is it reality and or somewhere in between, but there's, there's so much to just speculate with. So I think it's really important that, that we're tossing around all of these ideas tonight. And, you know, I, I would like to kind of turn it around a little bit to children with um, our, wired, our Wired Schools group that's um, hosting this event this evening. Our, our main focus is on raising awareness, uh, especially targeting to parents and teachers at schools um, to, to let them know about how the children are being um, affected their health impacts from the wireless technologies inside the classrooms, um, outside on the campus from cell towers and antennas, sometimes Wi-Fi they have in the school buses. Um, there are, as you may have noticed, there are some um, cancer clusters, uh, outbreaks, um, evidences of suicides becoming more and more prevalent, sadly. Uh, the connections of EMFs with depression and suicide and violence, we're looking more into that. We're going to be holding a roundtable, inviting um, some experts in to join with us to uh, invite with some parents to just do some brainstorming about what we can do to turn this around. But I, I know this is stepping a little bit outside your area of expertise, Tim, but you've shared that, you know, while that's so, you do have some opinions. and wondering if you have any messages you'd like to share to the parents and teachers um, of the schools these days on what they might do, what they need to be aware of? Well, my f personal feeling is that, that, that Wi-Fi has no place in school. And, uh, and it's, it, 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 I'm not a real expert on uh, the uh, medical or potential health effects of uh, wireless, but I do have con a lot of concerns in it, and I think there's substantial literature and substantial reasons to be concerned at that on that. But what concerns me most is the, the, the or from my perspective, the problem is impaired learning. It's socialization. It's attention deficit disorder, things like that. And you mentioned suicides. It's the social effect or consequence, a social consequence of, of of over reliance on social media uh, for children, it's just inappropriate, and I think that it uh, it doesn't help uh, teaching. Uh, certainly, people all you know, kids need to become computer literate at so, in some manner, and there's a way to prob probably do that in a school with computers, but not everywhere, and not mobile devices. I think they're just inappropriate for a school. Definitely. I totally agree with you. I, and back in my day, we had comp computer labs where you went to a class to learn about, you know, wired computers and learning how to work the computers. So um, I totally agree with you. And I understand from teachers that they, uh, when they say what's their biggest challenge about teaching these days, 
in, invariably they'll say those distractions of those phones, those kids are not paying attention to me. They're looking at their phones and they're designers who are, um, and they're tasked with making apps that are more and more uh, enticing for the children. So, I mean, they're, they, they're, it's all by a di- design by addiction and driving that. And um, yeah, yeah, so advertising. Yeah. Exactly. And, and like you say, they're, they're becoming more and more isolated from their peers. And I, I once um, heard of a, I think it was a middle grader or a high schooler. She said, no, I'm not going to call them, but I'll text them because she was intimidated by about getting voice to voice with their friends. So, I mean, that's pretty sad when you, when you yeah. think that we're at that place. And I think more and more schools are banning uh, the use of phones inside the schools, which, which makes sense. So I, I hope we can get to that point. Yeah, but, and I, well, even adults have a hard time with their attention disorder. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> The effects on kids is just terrible. It, absolutely. I mean, there's no age uh, restrictions on the addictive qualities of this technology, unfortunately. And, you know, I, it, I, I don't watch television much at all, but it, it's you're hard-pressed to find an ad that doesn't feature a phone. Whether you're ordering your pizza or your furniture or your mortgage, you know, it's through a cell phone. And they're normalizing and glamorizing it at the same time. Time. So it kind of speaks to our state of society these That's days. That's a good way to put it, yeah. Yeah. So, well, you know, thank you for that. And, and I, I recently put out, put out a, a little bit of a PSA style video and uh, reaching more and more people. I've been in contact with a mother um, out of Ripon, California. She, um, she, sadly, she's the mother of a cancer diagnosed uh, son. And um, they, they had so many outbreaks there, but um, you know, I've suggested to her that trying to reach the parents and teachers to kind of help them, you know, talk with one another, see what they think, but to, to work with their school board trustees to get them to wire the connections of the internet and the devices with either net cable or, um, and to cancel their uh, contracts with the cell towers, um, I understand that there's some money involved, but when you look at the health of the children, that really needs to be taken into consideration. And I'd like to think that they might be prepared to, um, if, if they don't get the type of action to keep their children from being irradiated, that they'd be prepared to, to pull the children out of school. And, and the teachers might be prepared to strike the staff, whatever, to step away. But there, there needs to be some consequences if their demands aren't met. But it's always good to try to meet them halfway, to try to help them do the right thing for the children. And um, it's, it's so serious when it's getting to this point. But, well, here again, it's a, it's, the secret is mobilization at the local level and uh, political action at the local level and with <clears throat> school boards and, and uh, city councils and people like that. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, in general, I mean, I've asked this, you know, what advice would you have to those, those of us who are feeling helpless and maybe a little hopeless with the, the, the looming push from the technology and, you know, standing up, I think we're maybe revisiting what we've already talked about a little bit, but, you know, what sorts of things can you suggest that we might do starting now to stand up for our rights to reverse these trends? Well, it's to be certainly vocal and active in in the local community and it's local political action starting at the local level, the city council level, the county, county level, governance levels uh, and get involved in, in school board levels and get involved in these activities and get the right people elected and if the and make it clear to the to the, the, the people in those positions that they that you that you're just not going to let this continue and uh, you got to to uh, to put the right people in those positions that's the only way to go I think that uh, and that works its way up to the state level and then ultimately, hopefully, to, uh, to the national level. But that's, that's a long way away at this point. I think that the, the, the action is really all politics is local and it has to start at the local level. 
That, that sounds good. And, and, and we found uh, with our group reaching out to local legislators that um, many of them, I mean, they're so busy, as we all are, um, that they haven't been able to, to look into this. But when we offer to help them understand the issues, they're open and, re and receptive. And, you know, they're people, uh, most of them, many of them have children of their own. Um, you know, this technology, this is affecting every living being on the planet, as you know. So I would think that they would be open to, you know, working together to find some uh, solutions here. So yeah, it's, I think, it's not an ideological uh, argument. It's not a, it's, it's a, it's, it's a common sense argument. It's exactly. Not a, very, very well put. A political uh, party, this party or that party. It's, it's, it concerns everybody. It's, this is a, a, a uh, what they call transpartisan issue. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's a really good way to put it. It affects everyone on the planet. And, I, and I, if I can back up a little bit, I wanted to share with you all, I was, I was really impressed. One of, one of the, um, the, the people who responded to wanting to attend tonight, um, she, if, if she's in the audience, she might, might appreciate this. But um, at the bottom of her message, she had these, these quotes that I thought were so strong. If I may share with you, it's our insatiable yearning for more for more has left has left us with less of the one thing upon which our entire lives depend the natural world the rush to blanket the planet with 5g constitutes an experiment on humanity and the environment that is defined as a crime against under international law and she said sent from a hardwire computer no wireless whatsoever for the sake of you me and the bees and like you know, you know, our bees, uh, our pollinators, uh, our whole food supply depends on them. And they're declining and everything is, is suffering, the birds and, and all of that. So we're doing it for everyone. So, um, you know, we're getting close to closing, wrapping this up, Tim, but um, was wanting to ask you if, you know, what is your opinion of the many products and gadgets that are out there? There's so many companies, you know, they, you, you, they say to identify a niche and fill it and you'll have success. Well, they see people getting panicky about what's happening and the radiation. How do I protect myself when I fly? You know, my children at school, what do, you know, clothing or little special devices for the phones. What are your opinion about those types of products? Well, you know, I, I can't really speak to that. I don't know, don't know much about that. Um, I think the bigger the, the 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 root of the problem it goes back to uh, unregulated capitalism <laughs> and, there, and and that's um, you know I'm 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 not against capitalism uh, but it's it can't be unregulated and that's what we have pretty much in this country and you can see it the uh, the, the, the in 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 I just got back from Europe I was in Sweden for a week and. Uh, it was like night and day. I mean, it's a civilized country and it was coming, I feel like I'm coming back to the hinterland here <laughs> in that respect. <laughs> but because there's a, there is a much more concern with personal privacy and, and consumer protection, I think there than, than here. Here we pretty much leave it to the industry and you've got to really push hard if you want to do anything. Uh, Ralph Nader's one of my uh, inspirations. Uh, he, um, uh, for many years has, has taken that uh, role that we have to uh, exercise more control over capitalism. There's a new book that I, another new book that pops into my mind. And I know this isn't directly addressing your question, but it's uh, indirectly. It's a, it's a book called uh, that I just heard about. I haven't read it yet, but I heard an interview by the author. It's called surveillance capitalism by uh, another media prof a law a professor, I guess, at, um, <clears throat> uh, I think it's Harvard uh, or Yale University. And uh, it's just a new book out and it talks about how Facebook and Google uh, really were, have, have restructured our economy. Uh, and uh, in a lot of ways, the, the products that you're, you're concerned about and you're complaining about or feeling uh, that you're being, we're being imposed with, uh, are consequences of this of a of of a economic system of unregulated capitalism, and it really needs to be 
brought under control. And that's the only way to, to address it. Um, there's, you know, I feel weird, you know, if I'm, I don't like flying in an airplane now, it's assumed that you're going to have, uh, uh, you're going to be saturated with Wi-Fi because that's, that's what everybody wants. And so how do you fly in a plane without Wi-Fi? Um, you're going to get it one way or the other on all the airlines. Um, it's just per pervasive in our environment and we have to start at the, at the uh, local level and change that. It's a big, it's a long, long process and we have to change the, the path that the technology has taken a lot. I think there's a lot of people, it's a little, I sense a certain pushback against technology, uh, this technology for technology's sake and for the sake of making money, uh, uh, you know, when you talk, whether you're talking about uh, autonomous vehicles or you're talking about artificial or internet of things, all these gadgets, mobile phones, 5G, wireless, these are all essentially out of control technologies. And we really, really need to rethink why, what do we really need in a, uh, what do we really need or what do we really want rather than what does somebody want to sell us? That's exactly. the way we have to look at it. Very good point. Very good point. And, and I, I, with the products and I've heard a lot of people saying that, um, um, rather than looking at ways to protect ourselves, um, while, while it's important to do so, it, in one regard, it can seem like you're resigning to it. You're, you're not saying, you know, I'm not going to protect myself from it because this needs to stop. And that, that's where we're going here. We're not going to just like compromise, but um, that, that's true. And like with the, the airline industry, I have a friend who has a part-time job as a baggage handler at DIA, one of the smart cities, and he collapsed on the tarmac when he was on, on, jo on his job. And I looked into the, the incredible density of um, cell towers and there on his job. I asked his permission if I could send him information, and he said yes. But in addition to the chemicals he's exposed to, there's also, you know, the, all of the... Um, the devices on board. And one of the women in our group um, is a retired um, flight attendant, and she has become sensitive, electro hypersensitive, and to this because of that. And, and the symptoms started slowly. She didn't really realize what it was coming from. But by the time they settled in, it was really too late. She's just so sensitive to that, sadly. But um, so, you know, it's all about raising awareness so people can make, make choices. Um, so I know we have a, a, a travel coming up soon, and we're going to be uh, doing a long drive uh, to avoid the radiation from flying. So, um, but, you know, that was a choice that we have, have to make here. So well, there's another, another you, you, what you just said gives me another example. I wrote a paper about five years ago called Getting Smarter About the Smart Grid. Yes. That paper was about smart meters and the ridiculous idea of putting microwave transmitters on everybody's house to, to just read your electric meter when, it was, it, when that's not the best way to do it. It was not the original intent of the technology. And, and, uh, and, and my purpose uh, last week in Sweden was to, uh, to set standards for a new generation of systems that don't work that way, that are hardwired uh, for ener managing, managing energy and solar energy we, and reading meters too. It's all, it's unnecessary. This technology exists, the, the smart meter technology has gone in a bizarre direction for no good reason, just to make money uh, it's just about making money, and it's uh, uh, the the the, stru the economic structure of the utility industry that's driven it, which is a is a mistake because it's a it's the worst approach to take technologically. So we get this stuff imposed on us. We really really need to rethink what we want and what we need in our environment, and not uh, just take what the industry hands us. Exactly. It's a good time to question authority. I think so, mon so many of us put a lot of stock in, in those uh, we see in quote unquote positions of power, whether it be government or medical practitioners, or we're just not questioning 
were just kind of say, oh, well, you know, you must be the expert, so I'll do whatever you say. You know, I'll take that prescription. I'll, I'll sign up for this or that. And, and, and we're just so busy with our heads down to our devices. It seems like that, that we're not thinking for ourselves. And, you know, that's, that's all part of the design as well. But, um, you know, we're, we're more and more of us are aware. I'm really encouraged that um, for, one, for one reason, so many people have signed up tonight for this presentation. And that's so encouraging. You know, we're all kindred spirits. We're interested in learning and figuring out what we can do about this to, um, to, to turn this around. So I really appreciate all you've shared here, Tim, and um, wanted to share in the comments section that we'll, we'll be putting a link to the PDF version of your report of Reinventing Wires, Future of Landlines and Networks. But um, is it also available in more of a paperback book form, a hard copy? Yeah. Is that yeah, hard copy is available. It's it was we have a, a, a limited we have a limited number. It's, it's uh, but uh, okay. I didn't know if it was really wants a hard copy. It's free. Uh, you can download a PDF. Uh, that's a two megabyte PDF, and uh, that you have the URL. Okay, for that. right. I'll include that in the comments section. So but if I, anybody I, really wants a hard copy, they should contact me, and we'll we'll find out how to get them one. Okay, that sounds more than fair. That's great. So um, we'll be we'll be moving to question and answer. And I was just made aware that the chat uh, the chat comments have been all coming to me rather than for everyone to see uh, for the last few minutes. But we can deal with that. Um, what we can go through that. But uh, Tim, wondering if you have any final comments before we move to the question and answer portion of our program. Well, that's fine. Go ahead. 